Good morning, everyone. My name's Faye Stenning, and I'm the Marketing Manager here at InfoTrack. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by Steve Johnson, who's our National Key Account Manager at CLS, and he's going to be taking you through today's session. Um, as mentioned earlier, before we begin the webinar, we do have a Q&A tab, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will be running a Q&A session at the end of this webinar. So if you do have any questions that come to mind, please just pop them in with your name into the Q&A box. Um, we'll do our very best to answer the questions that do come in through the course of the webinar today. But if not, as we'll have your name details there already, we'll follow up with you directly after the webinar if we can't manage to answer all of the questions during the course of the session and at the end. So I'll hand you over to Steve now so that he can take you through today's session um, and I'll come back to you at the end. Wonderful, thank you very much, Faye. Appreciate your uh, time and effort on this and always. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to the latest in this series of CLS webinars um, put on by InfoTrack. And as you can see from the headline, where today it's understanding restrictive covenants. Just to echo, echo what Faye's already said, please do post your questions uh, as, they, as they come through the session. Um, in the very final slide or two, we will actually be going over, over a few questions that have come in on previous webinars. Um, so that may well answer some of the some of the policy detail questions that you've previously uh, previously had. But as I say, we're very well welcome to take questions as we as we go through and keep an eye, eye out for those. So the agenda for today is we'll highlight, of course, what is a restrictive covenant, why they're in place. We'll highlight some typical examples of restrictive covenants and their impact on conveyances and on the sellers and buyers that you represent. We'll also do a little bit of exploration around the um, dichotomy of investigate restrictive covenant or insure against, because either is potentially a valid course of action in the course of the transactions that you're working on. And then we'll spend a bit of time on the specific restrictive covenant policy that CLS Property Insight makes available through InfoTrack. And in the course of that, we'll look at the statements of fact that are required to be signed up to and how we can deal with um, bespoke requirements that don't meet the standard statements of fact. We'll look, of course, at the loss events that the policy actually covers, and we'll do a little bit of a run through of those questions that have come up in previous webinars. So hopefully a useful agenda or so for the next 40 minutes. So we start then with what actually is a restrictive covenant. Well, they're binding stipulations that are written into a property's deeds or contract, typically by a seller, to regulate what a home or property owner can or cannot do with their house or land under specific circumstances. These covenants can bind or benefit subsequent landowners. How might they arise? Well, typically sellers impose certain terms on buyers to protect the land they were selling on the grounds of what they believe to be important. These restrictive covenants are placed on the new title and then persist as ownership changes hands. You know, as simple example is where the landowner, the seller, may not want their quaint cottage bulldozed for redevelopment, so they might covenant against development full stop or put certain restrictions on what could be built. The question is, of course, what then happens when those restrictive covenants are revisited several generations, several chains of ownership later? For example, one of my colleagues has dealt with a law firm who were representing a client seeking to convert a building into a nursing home. Aside from all of the other development hurdles, it turned out that this building had an ancient restrictive covenant prohibiting occupancy by anyone not of sound mind. Now, you can all decide whether or not that would be an enforceable covenant in modern times. But again, it's symptomatic of the fact that many of the restrictive covenants one might find in the course of a property transaction often are very reflective of the times at which they were first drafted and may no longer be relevant or even kind of morally acceptable. In, uh, in modern times. Others, of course, are very much live and very much relevant to the current transaction. And um, can, I, can I just, a um, little bit of feedback, just to let you know that we've got at least one microphone, I think, that isn't muted. So uh, if you can just all check your mutes, that would be, uh, that would be appreciated. Thank you. As I say, the, the nursing home example is an odd example, but it serves to introduce the idea fundamental to all restrictive covenants and resulting claims or attempts to have the restrictive covenant lifted and that being you know the characters involved when the covenant was first set up and their motives and intentions are critical 
What were the motives of people who originally established the covenant, when the land was originally transferred, and what is the best way of dealing with them for modern purchaser? So why might they be in place? Well, we've already introduced this in the previous slide, but generally the reason for the covenant being imposed, typically on the purchaser, is that the covenantee, usually the vendor, wants to protect other land or property they own or retain in the area, often including any that may adjoin the land that's been sold off. Once imposed, the covenant runs through with the land through future purchases. In many cases, covenants are drafted to uphold particular requirements in respect of residents of an estate. Housing developers and property management companies will often apply restrictive covenants to inhibit owners from starting work or other practices which could impact the neighbourhood. For example, it may set limits to maintain a desired level of uniformity between the properties or stop an area's character changing. Now, the image, you, the house you can see in the image on the left-hand side there is actually from my hometown, Southampton. And I can assure you that not all of Southampton looks like that, but nonetheless, there are a large number of estates throughout Southampton that were built in the late 1800s, early 1900s by the architect Herbert Collins. And in fact, my dad lives in a, a Herbert Collins house. Anyone with the freehold to one of these properties has to oblige with a number of restrictive covenants ranging from exterior paint color restrictions, uh, limitations on putting in double glazing. Essentially, you can't because we'll remove those character windows. You can only put in secondary glazing. You can't remove shutters where they are present on the property. And there are certain interior restrictions as well, all of which has put the brakes on my dad's very enthusiastic DIY. But nonetheless, that's uh, the choice he made when he moved into one of these nice looking properties. Now, just as an aside, there are also positive covenants which set out what the owner must do in respect of a property. For example, maintain a boundary fence or make a payment for a service charge. Positive covenants do not pass on to future purchases. And once the land is sold, these covenants cease and can no longer be enforced. At CLS, we do not provide legal indemnity cover for positive covenants. And this is because a positive covenants is something someone has to do. For legal indemnity insurance purposes, we would not class having to, for example, maintain your own garden or house as a financial loss. Now, typical examples of restrictive covenants. Well, at this point, we're going to introduce some typical restrictive covenants commonly seen on title deeds. And these might include limits on building a certain volume of residential properties on land or even completely prohibiting redevelopment. We'll have a case study of this type of restriction a little bit later on. There may be a restrictive covenant that requires that no alterations are to be carried out unless plans have been approved by the vendors or their architects. And this may apply beyond the bricks and mortar of the property, you know, requirements to seek approval on pruning or pollarding trees are not uncommon, even if the tree in question has no TPO associated with it. There may be a requirement not to build past a specific building line or height restrictions, for example, a, a maximum number of floors. And it could be that no trade or business is to be operated on the property or prohibition of specific types of trade. Once again, some of these can seem entirely reasonable, why others are very much a product of their time and era and worded uh, very much in the way the era demanded. You know, just as an example, we came across a uh, quite historic restrictive covenant in a, in a recent transaction, whereby the covenant read that the owner of the land essentially was not to erect or to allow to be erected on the piece of land hereby conveyed at any time hereafter, any beer shop, public house or hotel for the sale of malt or spirituous liquors. So um, the building in question had these rather unfortunate restrictions on them nonetheless. But again, you can see the wording is very much sort of a, a product of its, of its time. Now, at this point, I want to touch on protective entry. As well as restrictive covenants, it's not uncommon for office copies to contain protective entries. These arise where a certain document would have been submitted to the land registry on first registration of the company, but is now lost. That document may have contained a restrictive covenant which would still apply to the modern occupier or purchaser, but whose content and purpose is now unknown. The missing document that may, and the emphasis is very much on may, may contain a restrictive covenant that could have been lost for any number of years. 
that examples we've come across have been documents lost or damaged beyond legibility due to flood damage, documents lost when solicitors' offices were hit by wartime bombing, or even just loss of files during a particularly chaotic office move. Whatever the reason, the outcome is the same. There is a gap in the documentary history of the property, and that gap might have contained a restriction relevant to the prospective purchaser. The covenants might not even be breached, given they're unknown, and that, therefore there could be no risk at all. However, the risk introduced by the document gaps mean that commonly insurers is, insurance is considered on a just-in-case basis. Now, a little bit earlier, we mentioned restrictive covenants whose purpose was to limit certain forms of development or trade activity. And in this case study, we'll look at um, uh, an issue that revolves around exactly that trade activity restriction. It's also an example of the imbalance of power that can sometimes arise around covenants, where one party has considerably more knowledge of the topic than the other. And this is an example where the presence of a restrictive covenant, legal indemnity, was critical for the homeowner when dealing with to some degree that, that imbalance of power. Now, it's not uncommon, uncommon for land agents claiming to have the benefit of covenants to send letters out to individual property owners. The letters tend to have fairly minimal explanation, and request money from the property owner to have the covenants removed. While the covenants usually do exist, they would often date back to when a housing estate was constructed and sometimes have little relevance, especially to a property owner who has made little or no alteration to their property. Homeowners with little knowledge of property law may feel compelled to make payments after receiving these kinds of letters. Unfortunately, holding one of our restrictive covenant policies means they can bring in an expert to review the request, removing the power imbalance that I mentioned. And CLS claims handlers can and do assess the enforceability of covenants when considering a potential claim. Now, in this example, the company sent a letter to a CLS policyholder claiming to have the benefit of restricted covenants. It claimed that the policyholder had breached covenants by adding satellite dishes and aerials to the property and parking trade vehicles in the driveway. The company in question was requesting more than £300 to enter a deed of variation with the policyholder. The policyholder notified CLS because obviously at the time they purchased the property, the issue had come up and conveyancer through the conveyancer and they subsequently gone on to purchase from policy from us. The claims handlers were able to challenge the company in question to prove their ability to enforce the covenant. We did not hear back from them and needless to say the policyholder did not have to pay £300 and not only that but the in perpetuity policy remains in force going forward. Now although £300 is not a huge amount of money to be protected from but of course you also, or the, the insured party also gained through the policy, was access to expertise. And I think although, understandably, there's often a focus on a policy that may pay out you know, X amount of money, loss of value worth to the tune of £15,000 or an out-of-court settlement to the tune of £8,000, whatever it might be. Very often within these policies, the value that comes to the client isn't just that settlement figure, it's the access to expertise at no cost that then enables a claim issue to be resolved in the way that this claim subsequently was. So again, it's one of those pieces of value that perhaps isn't as explicit as the actual amount of money paid out, but nonetheless is something that is, uh, is useful for all policyholders. Now, as we've shown by the examples we've touched on so far, it's important that restrictive covenants, whether they're historic oddities or more fundamental to current occupants are dealt with there and then. Because the issues surrounding restrictive covenants can often be te technical in nature, it's advisable for any member of the public really to seek legal advice as soon as possible. And as a conveyancer, it would be of course your responsibility to review the relevant covenants that are recorded on the land charges register, as well as to look at the wording of the covenant to ensure that it's drawn up correctly and therefore enforceable. It's generally held that if a restrictive covenant has been breached without challenge for more than 20 years, then enforcement of that covenant by whoever benefits from it is unlikely to succeed. And the case most commonly cited is Hepworth v Pickles from 1900, where a building acted uninterrupted 
as a tavern, no doubt selling spirituous liquor, for 24 years, at which point the beneficiary of the covenant challenged the use, but was unsuccessful. And in line with that longevity of breach, the UK Finance Handbook, Section 511.2, states that breaches unchallenged for more than 20 years need not have indemnity insurance. It's not, in, it's not insisted on. So a restrictive covenant will generally be enforceable between the original contracting parties as a matter of contract. There can be situ but there can be situations where this is not so. For example, where the covenant is too uncertain or ambiguous to be capable of enforcement. The covenant, present though it is, may be prohibited by competition law and is unenforceable. Or the covenant, once again, present and well-defined, but nonetheless is contrary to public policy. For example, it contravenes equality laws. Again, symptomatic of the fact that when many of these covenants were drafted, of course, the world was a very, very different place. So for the covenant to be enforceable between the successors entitled to the original parties, the following rules for the passing of benefit must apply. The covenant benefits land owned by the person seeking to enforce it. The covenant must touch and concern or relate to the land owned by the person seeking to enforce the covenant. For example, the covenant affects the nature, quality or value of the land. The person seeking to enforce the covenant must either be the legal owner or have some recognised interest in the equity. Beneficiary in a will would be an example of the latter. But having established the possible enforceability of a restricted covenant, the conveyancer will usually look for options where insurance can be obtained to cover the liability of any further breach of contract. Those liabilities could include damages or compensation, alteration costs, production and value of the property, as well as legal expenses incurred. And again, we'll have an example of legal expense liability as a case study fairly shortly. Enforceability of covenants is a complex area, which is why, if you come across one on the type, client's title, it may be that insurance is the preferable option, especially when considered in terms of the speed and expense of insurance versus investigation. But that's not to say, of course, that investigation is not a valid route in many cases. So were you to go down that route, what then are the steps and implications of a restrictive covenant where it's investigated rather than insured? So, for example, if for some reason insurance cannot be obtained, the owners of the property could approach the individual with the benefit of the covenant in order to obtain retrospective consent for works maybe that have been carried out. If that person cannot be traced, refuses permission, seeks compensation for the breach or charges a fee which is prohibitive, then an owner can apply to the upper tribunal of the lands chamber to modify or discharge the restrictive covenant. However, it's worth noting that this process can be costly, and time consuming with, of course, no guarantee of success. And even if one was success successful, costs may not be paid by the beneficiaries of the covenant. And in fact, the beneficiaries of the covenant, were they to be successful, may force the unfortunately uninsured party to pay their costs, which of course is far from ideal. As above, if you or your client feel a restrictive covenant is unreasonable, you can make that application to the lands tribunal to have it modified or discharged. Now, in order to discharge the covenant, you must satisfy one of the following. One, the covenant is out of date. Two, there is an agreement to the discharge or modification between all of those with the benefit of the restriction. Now, this could amount to many parties. If you think of a covenant which benefits an entire estate, you might need end up needing permission from all of the homeowners on that estate who benefit from the covenant. Three, it could be that the following is satisfied in order to discharge the covenant, that the covenant restricts the reasonable use of the land. Again, the original motives around the covenant are relevant here. You know, limits on selling tea from a building may not have anticipated the rise in cafe culture, even if tea sales don't get close to those of coffee. And finally, that by removal of the covenant, it's demonstrated that no injury will be caused to those entitled to the benefit of the covenant by reason of its discharge or modification. Now, that being said, proceeding with works while ignoring a restrictive covenant can be 
somewhat risky. And in a worst case scenario, the individual proceeding with the works could be forced to completely undo the work and pay compensation to the beneficiary, the covenant. Ultimately, if you or your client chooses to, can choose to investigate or insure. However, it should be noted that if you decide to investigate and resolve, resolve the restricted covenant first, you may be excluded from the possibility of insurance at a later stage or create a situation where premiums are higher or there are certain clauses within an insurance policy which wouldn't have been there had policy been sought out in the first place. So if investigation is impractical or unwanted, then the legal indemnity route is often preferable. And there may be a number of reasons why indemnity insurance could be first choice. The covenants may be old, the original covenantee may be deceased or a defunct company. Alternatively, the benefiting parties may be known, <coughs> excuse me, but they may not agree for a release or modification. And as we touched on earlier, this could be costly and take an unacceptably long time. And as mentioned with estate covenants, approaches would have to be made to all owners of the estate. Therefore, an insurance policy that protects the insured from costs involved in the event of a against the breach of covenant is often an acceptable alternative to investigation. Now, I mentioned a little bit earlier that we were gonna have a case study or two, and our, our next case study highlights the value of indemnity policies in dealing with neighbors who turn out to be less than helpful. And here the indemnity policy enabled, enabled a project to progress and cost to be covered, otherwise might have led to a six figure loss of the insured party on the part of the insured party. Now the policyholder in this example owned a house and a large plot in the Midlands and decided to build a new house on part of that plot to sell on. Neighboring properties were believed correctly to have the benefit of a restricted covenant, could restrict development on the land, so cover was put in place. However, it didn't look like the claim was likely throughout the planning process and even well into the build. And this was primarily because the neighbor, who was the main risk, had actually verbally given their blessing for the development after initially putting in a written objection to the planning authority. Now, I'm quite sure here, you know, sirens and red flags are, are going off. Um, neighbors can be somewhat willful, and one might argue that the neighbor was even uh, deliberately putting themselves in a position of strength by that sort of unfortunately unrecorded verbal blessing. Um, however, and you won't be surprised to hear, they then changed their mind and wrote to the insured, claiming to have the benefit of said covenant when the build was complete. And of course, unfortunately, at this time, a buyer was even lined up. Now, so you may say this was a tactical approach. It might just be a uh, unfortunate uh, conflagration of, of circumstance. But nonetheless, the insured, of course, was now terrified of the buyer's lender getting spooked, losing the buyer altogether, came to us to make a claim under the policy that they'd taken out. And the CLS claims team instructed specialist solicitors whose first move was to assess the enforceability of the covenant and put together a report for the insurer. This also investigated the likely development profit and what a court might typically award the beneficiary of the covenant in lieu of an injunction. Now, a court can typically award in the region of 30 to 50% of the profit in these instances. And it was decided that due to the fragility of the insured sale, a quick initial offer to the neighbor would be the best move. And this was made at 20,000 pounds. The offer was refused, but the message was sent to the neighbor that we, we collectively, claims handlers and obviously the insured party, wanted to resolve the matter in a timely fashion. After the initial offer was rejected, it was somewhat hard to get the neighbor to re-engage. And our concern was that they simply wanted to block the sale of the newly built property. You know, and once again here, you have the claims handlers and the various experts engaged on by them acting on behalf of the insured party um, without cost to the insured party. Again, the benefit of the policy. Were the insured party to have, or uninsured party to have to go and engage those experts directly, of course, there would have been sort of significant outlay to engage with that expertise. And to break the deadlock, our solicitors doubled their efforts to get a deal, even offering to go in person to meet the neighbor and their solicitors. And eventually their persistence paid off with a deal being struck 
for £50,000 in exchange for the release of the covenant, as well as the neighbour's reasonable cost. Now, while this was a larger sum than first quoted, um, it was considered to be right around the limits of what a court might reasonably be expected to award the neighbour. However, the insured party and the claims team were aware that prolonging the dispute by going to court would have taken several months and lost the insured, the buyer for their property. And that a, a 50K sort of essentially voluntary settlement allowed our insur insured party to get their sale completed, the new owner to move in and everyone to move on within six months of the claim being notified. The insured had also benefited from around £12,000 worth of expert legal advice and pays hand. So I think it's fair to say that for a policy of around £400-odd, they were very happy with the outcome and how the policy had come to their aid. So some claimants give up quickly. Some dig in when they know that they can make life difficult for a would-be developer or other party. Um, some make life difficult when they think they can get away. Everyone will be different. So, of course, to be fair, are absolutely standing by the covenant as a reasonable restriction on the proposed activity. Um, and it's not a financial concern. This is more about quality of life or a quiet enjoyment. Concern. And that, of course, is entirely, entirely justified. Restricted covenant claims are often less about the covenants and more about the people who are benefiting from them or burdened by them. It's the handling of these um, individuals or companies, as well as the use of specialist property lawyers that make the CLS restrictive covenant policy such an asset for those burdened by the covenants themselves. So we're going to start now to take a little bit of a dive into the policy itself. And over the next few slides, we'll consider the statement of fact options around the policy and how they're deployed within the InfraTrack platform. We'll look at the loss events that the policy covers, and we'll highlight some questions that come in on previous runnings of the webinar. And I, I can see we've had a few questions posted already. My thanks for those. We'll, we'll, return, we'll certainly return to those at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the webinar. So in a nutshell, our policy would cover the situation where a property is subject to known or unknown restrictive covenants, which may or may not have been breached. The policy would cover against any party with the benefit enforcing or attempting to enforce the covenants after the inception of the policy. Um, historically, of course, each case was individually underwritten with the benefit of a presentation from solicitor. Uh, but over the years, of course, the underwriting process has been streamlined and the vast majority of CLS policies can be obtained online now. And of course, many of you, I suspect, will already be familiar with the workflow that InfoTrack um, provide when engaging with CLS policies. One of the comparatively recent um, additions to that workflow is um, the CLS principle of variable statement of fact. And so you'll see this if you're traveling through the InfraTrack platform ordering policy. And essentially what it means is that we, of course, on each of our policies have our entry level statements of fact. You know, for example, statement of fact one, the property is a single house or flat in England and Wales. But through the variable statement of fact principle, you're able to amend state, select from other statements of fact as well. You know, maybe the property is, in fact, you know, a collection of up to five properties, or maybe it's a commercial property or mixed use, whatever it might be. You'll see that that interaction with the InfraTrack platform means that you're capable of putting in variation to the statement of fact while still staying online and proceeding quickly through to being able to access that draft policy or subsequently to place an order. The point of the variable state back principle is to give you every opportunity to have the immediacy of getting hold of your draft or your policy there and then online. And what that means is those policies that do drop offline for bespoke consideration directly with an underwriter, typically now are only those which are quite complex, quite unusual, really, really require an underwriter's, um, underwriter's immediate attention. For those of you, again, that use the InfraTrack platform, you'll be familiar with the process whereby selection of a bespoke policy automatically generates um, an email that goes directly into our InfraTrack uh, policy help desk, and you'll then proactive receive, proactively receive communication from our underwriters um, in good time in order to progress your bespoke policy requirements. Now, in terms of the loss events covered by the CLS policy, 
What I'd just like to do at this stage is just to run through the eight forms of loss event that the insured party can actually benefit from when they take out a restrictive covenant policy from CLS. So firstly, and I think as we've alluded to previously, that any reasonable legal or other professional fees and expenses um, are covered as required to commence, defend, or make a settlement in a legal action relating to the restrictive covenant. Um, we also cover the cost of an out of court, the legal costs associated with the lead in to an out of court settlement relating to a restrictive covenant. Um, typically, damages, compensation costs, or expenses which the insured party may have to pay um, coming as a result of a restrictive covenant issue. Also, the insured party may find that the cost of altering, demolishing, or reinstating all are part of the property as required by an order relating to a restrictive covenant. Once again, the policy would seek to provide cover for that, for those forms of um, property impact, alteration, demolition, or reinstating. We would also, and you'll see this uh, amongst many of the CLS policies, provide cover for a reduction in the market value of the property caused directly by a restrictive covenant calculated at the date of what we term the loss event. So there's a variety of mechanisms by which the loss of value can be established, but if subsequently a, uh, a previous breach of the restrictive covenant has, and the correction of that breach leads to a diminution of the market value of the property, that will be covered by the insurance policy. In addition, any money that the insurer permits the insured party to pay to a third party to free the property from the restrictive covenant will be covered by CLS policy. And there is a, a general sort of catch-all at the very bottom of the loss event that, you know, in general, any other costs and expenses that the insured party incurs because of the insured risk, the restrictive covenant, could be covered subject, of course, to the insurer's written consent. And what we'll do, uh, or rather what InfraTrack will be doing after the, uh, after the seminar, is they'll be distributing these slides, a link to the recording, and a, an example sample of the CLS restricted covenant policy. So I hope that will be useful for you as follow up to this session. Now, I mentioned a little bit earlier as well that we're going to um, just go through some questions that come up in previous runnings of this webinar. So if you'll just forgive me, I'll start to read through the questions and the answers that have come in from our underwriting team in relation to those questions. Um, firstly, is it possible get breach of restrictive covenant indemnity insurance for a new build before planning permission has been applied for where the new build will be in breach of a restrictive covenant? The simple to answer to this is yes, we are always willing to provide insurance wherever possible and we understand that some clients purchase land unconditional to planning. For these matters, we'll always carry out a full underwriting review and should our investigations be uh, identified there are mitigating factors, we could offer cover. As you expect, the premiums on these policies may be more expensive than the standard online versions, and there may also be a, an excess. But as I say, the simple answer to that question is yes, cover can be provided. Uh, next question we received fairly recently was, is this policy available post completion of the purchase? Say after a couple of, couple of years after the, the, the per property purchase, the client wants to buy a policy. Well, we always tread with caution where an indemnity is being requested where a property transaction is not taking place. The reason for this is we would be concerned as to why the indemnity was not incepted when the original transaction took place, and even more importantly, why the indemnity is now being sought. Um, in most scenarios where we see these requests, it's been where, there, there's, where a material risk has arisen and a client attempts to obtain insurance retrospectively. As you can imagine, it's very difficult for us to construct insurance in this way, which is why it's so important that title risks are considered during the purchase. Having said that, if a client wishes to alter their property post completion and are aware that their proposed alterations could impact on the covenants, there's no reason why we can't assist and discuss those individual cases. And one more question, can we refer clients directly to you? Well, the context from the questioner was that they needed to set up FCA approval, uh, needed to get their FCA approval set up for insurance policies, and were awaiting at the time their authorization to go onto the exempt professional firm register. So they just wondered in the meantime, could they refer clients directly to us? Well, unfortunately, we don't place indemnity policies with the consumer directly. 
the main reason for this is that we're essentially not regulated in order to provide that direct to consumer service. Our indemnities are designed to support the property transaction where a solicitor or licensed conveyancer will be assisting the seller or the buyer, and it fits in well with the consumer's journey through their, their legal profession. So unfortunately, we, uh, we can't service individual um, consumers, home buyers directly. We have to work with yourselves as, as conveyancers. And uh, I hope that has provided sort of useful question, useful questions and for you. Um, that brings us to the close of our webinar. My, my sincere thanks for your, your attendance. It's very much appreciated. And also my thanks for the team at Infotrack for, uh, for promoting this webinar. Um, there will be more in the new year, so keep an eye out for, uh, for messages around those. But I think, Faye, it'd um, be great to bring you back in at this point and uh, see what we do for the, for the wrap-up. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Steve. Um, we haven't actually had any real questions that have come in, only one to ask if a copy of your presentation is going to be available. Um, and you have already covered that. Yes, we will be circulating a copy of the slides and the recording to all attendees. So um, if you have missed anything or you want to recap on anything, it will all be sent through to you and be available. Um, I'm happy to keep it open for a little while longer if we have any more questions come through. Um, if you'd like to leave it open for another minute, Steve, and see if any other questions come through. Yeah, absolutely. Alternatively, if you've obviously got the um, the contact details for both CLS and Infotrack there, so do feel free to pop any pop any questions through um, that may may come up as a result of the material that gets sent out afterwards. Okay. Well, it, it looks like you must have done such a thorough job with this webinar, Steve, that there are no questions. Oh, hang on one moment. I was a bit early there. Looks like we do have another one. Um, I do have a question for you, Steve. Is a, re a restrictive covenant that predates 1925 enforceable? Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for that question, question Rachel. Um, our understa my understanding, and I will check this with our, with our underwriting team, is that, yes, they would be enforceable. Um, although that's conditional on some of the items we mentioned a little, early, little earlier, for example, if there's been a breach of that covenant for more than 20 years, then from the precedent set back by the 1900 case, it may well be that that, that covenant, present though it is, is not enforceable. But um, longevity of covenant typically isn't a signal that the covenant itself is no longer enforceable. Um, what I'll do, though, I will come back with a sort of a formal reply on that. So you have, a, have an absolute from me. Lovely. Thank you. Well, I think as oh, one more question. Uh, this is from Holly and she has asked, please, can you remind us of the case name you mentioned earlier, Steve? Yeah, it's Hepworth v Pickles. So and that was around that was around 1900. Thank you. And we have another question. Oh, they're coming through now. How would you deal with restrictive covenants such as having an aerial or planting bush or fence? And how serious would you take this breach? Would it be appropriate to ask for an indemnity policy on this? Um, the, the honest answer to that is we would not make a judgment as to the the seriousness ultimately it's down it's for the home buyer or the property buyer to decide how significant that restrictive covenant could be for their you know enjoyment or activity on the on the property um something which might seem entirely benign may actually for, for one individual might actually be quite you know a significant restriction on the property for them so unfortunately, that's not really something we'd be able to make a judgment on. It's entirely down to the, the property occupier um, to make that, make that judgment. I'm quite sure they would, they would refer to yourselves for, for advice. We would certainly provide insurance on essentially the sort of the full form of restrictive covenant. We don't seek to sort of say, well, look, this, this one is minor to the point where we don't think insurance would be necessary you as an individual that's that's very much their judgment lovely thank you steve um i have another question for you if a breach has occurred continuously since the new build for example no satellite dishes since 1998 is it enforceable 
If it hasn't been challenged there for 20 years or more, and 1998 would, uh, would put us into that sort of territory, then the precedent set by Hepworth v Pickles, um, and which is then sort of echoed further by the guidance from the UK Finance Handbook, is that the restrictive covenant would not be inf enforceable. That doesn't necessarily mean that someone would, wouldn't try to enforce it, but the precedent of Hepworth v Pickles is still being relied on now that a, that a breached covenant, unchallenged for 20 years or more, is generally unenforceable. Lovely, thank you. Um, I've still got some more questions for you. Um, this next one is asking, often alterations in a former council property require the council's consent. Is planning permission enough or does there need to be a specific consent in order for it to not be a breach? Um, Aisling, that's a really good question. Do you mind if I take that one away? I'd like to make sure I, I, I get a full sort of underwriter input into that question. Um, and what we'll do, just so for, for everyone's, everyone's notice, all of the questions that are being asked, um, I will put together a, a Q&A document, which I can then supply back to InfoTrack for distribution around all of the group as well. So Aisling, I won't, I won't try to answer that now because I want to make sure I'm 100% right. I'll come back to you on that. Thank you. Okay, fabulous. Um, I have another question for you. There are a number of policies available, for example, known unknown covenants or missing documents. Can you go through the various types of policies, please? Yeah, at all. For, this, for the sake of brevity, um, I'm going to put together a list of all of the policy types that, that relate to this form of um, this form of restriction, if you like, within the uh, within the restrictive covenant uh, within the um, conveyancing process. Um, as you can imagine, the catalogue of policies is quite substantial. What we do have, and again, Faye, if you're happy to distribute this afterwards, is we have an A to Z brochure of all of the policy types that we offer um, with a brief summary of the, the policies themselves alongside, alongside each. So you have that there as a, as a sort of PDF maybe to store on your, on your laptops. Equally, I know from the InfraTrack platform, there are menus which can sort of give a brief summary of those policies. But I think in the spirit of your question, Atul, to have everything in one place, um, maybe, Faye, if I send you that, that brochure document, um, you'll have the sort of the full A to Z, and I'll, I'll highlight the particular policies Atul's, Atul, Atul has asked about in the Q&A document I'll put together. Perfect. Yes, that's no problem at all. Um, I have another question for you. Could you list the criteria for a correctly drawn up restrictive covenant and the criteria for enforcement, please? So, Mohammed, the, the criteria for a correctly drawn up restrictive covenant, I'm going to refer that into the um, conveyances that we have working, working with us, the lawyers that we have working with us, so that I can correctly answer that, if that's OK. OK, and we have another question for you, and I think we're probably this will be one of our last questions because we are sort of running out of time now and I'm conscious that we don't want to run over. But we, this question is, they're just wondering whether a restrictive covenant would still be binding if the company who originally developed an estate and imposed the covenant subsequently sold to a different development company years down the line. Would the restrictive covenant still remain enforceable? Um, typically the restrictive covenant passes with the passes with the sale of the land. So even if, even if a the originator of the covenant has long since departed, gone bust, um, whatever, it, whatever it might be. The covenant is passed on with the title, so would still be relevant at the latest purchase that you may find yourselves acting on, typically. OK, lovely. Yeah. Well, we are, we are now out of time, I'm afraid. We do still have some other questions, but we will come back to those ones individually for the people that have raised them. So I'd like to say a big thank you to Steve for his time today. Yeah, um, and my, my thanks to everyone for the questions as well. That's, that's much appreciated. And I, and I hope everybody has found this session informative and thank you to everyone that has attended. If you have any other questions about anything that you've learned today or questions that relate um, to ordering indemnities through the InfoTrack platform, then you can either contact us using the details that are currently on your screen or you can reach out to your account manager who will be able to assist you. Um, as already mentioned, this session is being recorded and we will send you a copy so that you can refer back to Steve's notes. So all that's left to say is a big thank you so much for joining us and have a lovely rest of your day.